welcome to Barnyard Language. We are Katie and Arlene, an Iowa sheep farmer and an Ontario dairy farmer with six kids, two husbands, and a whole lot of chaos between us. So kick off your boots, reheat your coffee, and join us for some Barnyard Language, honest talk about running farms and raising families. In case your kids haven't already learned all the swears from being in the barn, it might be a good idea to put on some headphones or turn down the volume. While many of our guests are professionals, they aren't your professionals. If you need personalized advice, consult your people. Welcome back to Barnyard Language. It is uh, 2024, starting year with an F-bomb. Arlene, I guess now you can do the intro. <laughs> okay, well, that's that's it, really. Welcome back to the podcast. It's a new year. Katie's already annoyed at something. <laughs> Tell me about it. What's going on? So I'll post a picture in the uh, the Barnyard Language Facebook group. If you're not in it, you'll have to join to see what it is. But several years ago, I inherited my grandparents' Davenport that they bought in 1937 when they got married, and it's been recovered once. So I got the bright idea last year that I would take it to get it reupholstered. Um, and it's taken a year for it to get finished because it was actually that big of a project. So for clarification, a Davenport is a couch? A fancy couch. Yeah, a fancy. Okay, a fancy couch. Got it. It was brown velvet most recently. Originally, it was wide whale mustard yellow corduroy. So just envision that for a moment. Anyway, so I took it in to get reupholstered. And apparently last time they upholstered it, they literally just put new fabric over the old fabric. So the cushions were, uh, what, 86 years old. And the springs were 86 years old, and the dead dust mites in the cushions were 86 years old. Anyway, so now that I've spent a reasonable for the amount of work, but obscene for a couch amount of money on this couch, um, although spread over like 90 years worth, it's really not much at all. Sure, yeah. And, And the work took a year, so yeah, spread that out too. It, of course, has to go in a place where no member of my family will be allowed to touch it, ever, probably. This is just just a looking couch. Yeah, yeah. I will probably not even be allowed to sit on it. It will simply be a, a decorative piece at this point. And Do you have a parlor? I need a parlor. <laughs> it feels like the kind of thing where you'd need to have a parlor. For. We're going to have to put on an addition so we can have a parlor. Yeah, when, when company calls... We'll pull the plastic cover off, throw the doilies down along the back for their hair oil. Yes, and, uh, yeah. When gentlemen callers come, we'll allow them into the parlor. Anyway, so this thing has to go in my office, which is a small room and is already full. And in the process of doing a major purge on my office, my headphones are, I mean, obviously, they're here somewhere but they were not hanging on my mic stand as they should have been. And if you hear all sorts of crunching in the background, it's because the guinea pigs were screaming at me. So I gave them a head of lettuce, which they are now eating very noisily. So long story short, the uh, it's a good thing I didn't make a resolution for 2024 to be any less chaotic than 2023, because <laughs> it sure as shit isn't starting out that way. Anyway, Arlene, how are things at your place? Well, before we get to my house, why don't we like at least recap a little bit of what happened in the holidays? Because we haven't talked to each other for, for a couple of weeks. So how was Christmas in your house? Was it also chaos? A lot of screaming. The happy kind? 97% of it was good. Oh, good. Yeah, the girl child got a Barbie dream house. And it was all her dreams come true? I've never heard her at that much of a lack for words before she was very excited for anyone who doesn't as i did not fully understand the scale of a barbie dream house this thing is like four feet tall and like almost six feet wide barbies are tall dolls they need ceiling height yeah it's uh it has an elevator it has a water slide it came with dogs which i thought was pretty cool um how many days did it take to assemble only one because i locked myself in our bedroom with a beer and it was basically the highlight of the holidays for me. I sat very quietly and assembled a Barbie dream house and drank my beer. And no, I didn't look at the instructions because instructions are for weenies and it's only a Barbie dream house. Um, the boy child was very pleased 
with his uh, machine sheds that we had custom made. And we got a rug of an aerial map of our farm from Boundary Rugs. And the kids loved it. Um, it now has pride of place in the middle of my living room. So it's a good thing it's a nice rug. And then last week after Christmas, a gate got left open in our cattle pasture. Not by anyone who lives here. And 13 of our heifers migrated to the neighbor's place about two miles through the woods and through some other fences that aren't ours and nice. uh, got in with his bulls. So all that looting that we had just done will be redone so that they're not pregnant. And today, finally, everybody went back to daycare and work. And other than the guinea pigs, it is very, very quiet. And it's amazing. And if anyone needs me, I'm going to be looking for my headphones. So were they home for the the week between Christmas and New Year's? They went to daycare, I think. The children, not the cows, right? The cows were not home that whole week. Sure, yeah. No, yeah, they were gone. Yeah, they took a holiday. I took the boy child and I went to a movie with his best friend and the best friend's mom and went to see Migration, which was about ducks. It was harmless. Loosely about ducks. Yeah. It was a two hour long movie about ducks, but there was popcorn and there was cherry coke and the boys sat in front of us, which they thought was just wildly exciting to be allowed to sit without an adult um, directly in front of us in a mostly empty movie theater. But, you know, they're, they're five. It was pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, that's good stuff. Other than that, not much. A fair amount of fighting between the, well, a fair amount of fighting. I was going to say between the kids, but by the end of yesterday, it was pretty just continual. They get along really, really well, the kids do. But when they're not getting along well, they're actively trying to murder each other. Anyway, Arlene, how are things at your place? Things are pretty good. We, It seems we've started a second round of some kind of sickness. So... With a big family, anyone knows that that means that it could last anywhere from a day to weeks, because who knows who's going to get it next. So hopefully whatever it is, is short-lived. But it came with Christmas because that's what happens when you get together with other humans. And that's fine. It's, you know, if you want to get together with people, that's the risk you take. So, um yeah, we might have some sick people here over the next week or so. Um, my second second oldest seemed to be the first in our family to, to have it. So we'll see what happens going forward. But new year, new illness. But Christmas itself was good. I feel like that was my real introduction to parenting, you know, because before you have kids and parents are always like, we have kids and now we're sick all the time. And I was like, yeah, right. And I remember quite clearly having to take the girl child in for her, I don't know, her six month checkup maybe. And she was sick. And the doctor said, do you know where she got these germs? And I said, cause I mean, she was still staying at home. She wasn't in daycare, so she wasn't exposed to much. And I had to admit that a few days before she had licked a shopping cart at Walmart. And I was like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know where it came from. But yeah, I think we've been sick since that day in, in 2017. Yeah. <laughs> yeah perpetually. Yeah. So yeah. Humans are gross. Yeah, it's true. Yes. Yeah. So we, yeah, we started out with my husband's side of the family on the 20th of December, and then my side of the family celebrated it on the 30th. So we kind of had a, a stretch there of, of celebrations spread over days, but also quiet days in between, which was nice. Um, my oldest wanted to uh, make some money while she was home. So she's been doing some chores. So that meant that some mornings I actually got to sleep in and not have to milk, which is both nice for the sleeping in factor and also just means that I am more productive during the day because if I will admit that if I'm the one who has, is getting up to milk in the morning, I almost always have to have a nap at some point because I can't get, can't get through the entire day without fitting a nap into um, based on the hours that I, that I was working and not going to bed at night. So that was nice. And Christmas Day itself was actually quite quiet, which for me is fine. My parents come for brunch and then we did go to my husband's parents for supper. But 
because kind of the bigger family gathering had already happened. That was a pretty low key, just have dinner. All the presents had been done. So Christmas morning was not like as chaotic as it has been. And at the end of Christmas night, I even said to my husband before we went to bed, like we got through Christmas day with no one crying, which I don't think for very many years, myself included, I'm, I will admit there were lots of lots of years that I was the one crying too, that we got through all of Christmas Day with, with no tears. So that felt like a milestone that I didn't know I was looking forward to, but it happened. So there's hope out there for those of you with really... I think I might have been the only one who cried on Christmas Day here. So maybe next year you'll hit that milestone, but yeah. My youngest is nine, so I mean, like, you got a few years before you before you catch up. And New Year's Eve, we actually stayed up. We saw midnight and stayed up past midnight, which now we are paying for. It's we're recording on the second of January, and it'll probably be a few days before we uh, recover from the fact that we we did actually give in to a little bit of peer pressure. We went to a, a party at a friend's place, and everyone was having fun. We were having doing like a little euchre tournament so everyone was was still in the middle of games and so we didn't want to stop either but yeah there were no we weren't the only dairy farmers in the crowd though and there were some messages going around about the fact that everyone was having a bit of regret about having uh, stayed up that late but we saw midnight so that felt like a milestone too because it's been a few years since we've stayed up that late now the kids want to stay up that late but we're, we're like okay see you in the morning then tell us how midnight was no the the holidays are very quiet here jim only has the one sister who has two nieces who are young teenagers and I'm an only child and my in-laws live directly across the road so it is very easy and low-key for us to all get together and then we only have to I don't want to say we only have to do it once but there's no this family and that family and that family over there and right yeah it's not spread out over weeks yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I managed to fit in visits to both my grandmothers on on separate days, so that was nice too, to be able to see both my my grandmas, who are both in their their nineties and doing relatively well, so it's nice to fit in those those visits into the holidays too. So why don't we go ahead and introduce our first guest of twenty twenty four? All right. So today we are excited to be talking to Jacob Beaton, who is joining us from British Columbia. And JP, Jacob, I'm hoping that you can pronounce for me your tribal name because I saw it online and practiced a few times, but I don't think I'm going to be able to manage it. So could you tell us your tribal name and your version of where you live? Sure, yeah. So my tribal name is Chopper Gotwin Skeek, and uh, it means a uh, compulsive compulsively building eagle so my clan is eagle clan which is a sneak part of the name and the jopish uh gotwin jopish is like a compulsive gotwin building eagle so like a you know my wife likes to say i'm i'm somebody who can't sit still i always need to be doing something and so uh, the name was given to me quite a few years ago based on my life like what i do so uh, and our um, traditional system is matrilineal, so uh, which, to my understanding, most, if not all, Indigenous nations were matrilineal societies. So um, what that means is that your name, like so in colonial-based society, it's patrilineal, so your last name comes from the dad, whereas in a matrilineal society, your name and like who you belong to and your property and your rights and everything come through the mother instead of the father. Um, so I'm an eagle because my mother's an eagle and my mother's mother and so on. And in terms of where I live, I live in Gitsan territory um, on the Skeena River um, in northwest uh, British Columbia, what's now British Columbia. Um, it's not my home territory. I'm actually from the ocean um, end of the Skeena River and the ocean, um, but I grew up in this area uh, because my dad was a teacher there and uh, my mom had worked there. So it's kind of, um, it's close to home, but not home, if you know what I mean. For sure. Yeah. So Jacob is an American who's learned a lot about Canadian geography in the last three seasons that we've been doing this, which is basically more than the zero that I started out with. Um, can you tell us a little about where you live? Because I know 
you know, Arlene and I both have city friends who think that where we live is rural, but I Googled where you live and it's, uh, that's a different level of rural from where we both are. Totally meets the definition of the sticks, 100%. Yes. Uh, so we are um, just about a thousand miles north of Vancouver, BC, um, you know, about 13, 1400 kilometers um, driving. Um, we're much closer to the southern tip of the Alaskan panhandle than to uh, um, Washington State, for example. Um, and in fact, we are very remote, but we live on a small highway called Highway 37, which is called the Poor Man's Alaska Highway. So basically, it's a more direct route to Alaska. So we have a lot of uh, tourists in the summer um, driving right through our farm. So the highway actually goes right through our farm. So it was kind of our backup plan. If farming didn't work out, we could put up guest cabins and host tourists trying to get to Alaska. <laughs> um, so... I thought maybe you were going to open a toll road right through the middle of your farm. That has definitely been a been an idea as well. <laughs> I was I was laughing. I was trying to explain to my kids where it was, and I said, "Well, it looks like it's you know ten hours to catch a cam, but you can't go there this week because it looks like the uh, the seas were too rough. There was a storm blowing in." So I told my husband it would be catch a can't this week. That's right. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's it's. Uh... You can't go there right now. Yeah, it's a tricky place because um, a lot of Canadians and I'm sure Americans think that we live in like the Arctic, you know, based on how far north we are. However, anybody who's familiar with Alaska would know that, um, you know, there's a lot of good growing and food production in Alaska and Alaska is much further north than we are. Um, and we're in a very mild climate zone. So w with the American climate zone classification, we're nearly a zone six. So we're a zone what's called a five AB. So we're kind of in between five and six. Um, so sometimes we're a zone six, sometimes we're a zone five, basically. Um, and with the additional daylight in the summer, we get really aggressive um, uh, plant production. Uh, anything that will, will be a fast grower with more sunlight um, grows overnight. Um, where we are and then of course our winters are darker and you know not so much sunlight so uh yeah it's it's interesting you know like a lot of folks think of the um sort of yeah so the climate zone that we're in extends from uh northern california all the way up the coast um just past us so it's a fairly similar production i was gonna say that's that's interesting because you're in a warmer zone than we are here in northern iowa and we're how much further south than you guys are. But that's, yeah, I mean, I will admit that I assumed it would be pretty Arctic up there. But also, you know, lower 48 Americans, we don't. <laughs> right. Anything north of Minnesota is glacier all the way to, to Russia. Mm -hmm. You've got, yeah, you've got that whole Pacific Northwest section right where they don't get nearly as cold as the rest of us so you are kind of leading us into our usual starting question which is what are you growing so that's uh obviously you're growing a lot of different things on your farm but um yeah you're growing also a business and a family so can you tell us some of the things that you're growing well the main thing we grow is people so we operate a training farm um and we are 100 percent focused on training indigenous peoples um and from canada um, and then beyond that, we are uh, technically a mixed vegetable um, farm. And a lot of people ask, well, why not animals? And the answer is very simple. It's we can't afford it. Animals are expensive. So those of you with animals will appreciate the amount of infrastructure and cost that's required to raise animals. We just aren't at that level yet. Vegetables are much cheaper. Um, and uh, of course, kids. Yes, we have two boys. Um, and they're age 15 and 17 right now. And we've homeschooled them from the beginning. Um, and uh, they've been on a lot of life adventures. We're actually currently in Cancun, trapped in Cancun. Uh, supposed to be home, um, but my eldest son had life-saving emergency surgery on Saturday night here in Mexico. Wow. Which, uh, for Canadian listeners, you do not want to experience. I've never had to deal with insurance, health insurance companies before. And I did purchase travel health insurance. And we ended up in an American hospital, which I didn't know there was such a thing in Mexico, an American-owned hospital out of Florida. 
and it felt like we were being held hostage with 10 guns to our heads and the hospital making a signed paper saying that we were going to pay the maximum price and maximum interest and you know the insurance company saying we don't want to pay unless you move to one of our hospitals down the highway and the surgeon saying your son could die if he doesn't go into operation right now so wow. we had an american experience, healthcare experience which i've never had before and it and it was horrible i'll say i was just like you know appreciated the canadian system you know i, I like to say canadians complain about our health care until you need it <laughs> like it saves your life and then you're like wow this is pretty cool you know i got like a, yeah, yeah. a million dollar surgery yeah i only had to pay for parking yeah yeah exactly like my uncle just went through a hip replacement surgery and it's like okay you're next on the list here you go here's a new hip you know don't have to pay a penny yeah whereas down here is he doing okay now oh uh, my son is okay yeah so he he had a undiagnosed appendix appendicitis a burst appendix um that went on for nearly five days with us and doctors thinking it was food poisoning or or parasite and so it was masking you know um the symptoms and it got really really bad and uh, we were supposed to fly home on sunday and we brought him right to a doctor here in cancun and she was amazing and she correctly correctly diagnosed him as having acute appendicitis and she said he has to go now and so she called and found out which hospital had the abdominal surgeon like they have surgeons but they rotate through different hospitals that's really scary yeah so um yeah so it was super scary so um but the doctors were just phenomenal um and yeah the hospital staff have been fantastic but he's in, he's in very high pain and, you know, they've had him on morphine, which is like the last thing you want your kid to be on, or one of the last things you want your kid to be on in a hospital, I think is morphine. Um, but yeah, they just basically said, if it had been any later, he, you know, it'd be an ICU, right. Um, instead yeah. of a recovery ward. Um, so we really lucked out in that way, but it's, it uh, turned into a travel nightmare with insurance and we're still dealing with insurance, like still not sure, you know, like what's going to happen with our insurance coverage um, and the fact that he ended up in the quote wrong hospital. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And the, yeah, then the, and uh, figuring out how to, when you can safely get back home and all that kind of stuff too. Right. Exactly. Which we're still trying to determine. Yeah, exactly. Because when, when the insurance company tells you you can go home and when the doctor tells you, it might not be the same thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So so we're just um, living in limbo at the moment um, and uh, hoping for the best and planning for the worst, which is, I think, something all farmers, ranchers, food producers are very familiar with. It's kind of your regular habit. So, um yeah, this has just been the vacation from hell, though. Yeah. <laughs> we had the most stressful, difficult year of all time. And we're like, okay, we're going to go to two, to Mexico for um, a couple of weeks, and we're just going to recharge our batteries. And we got scammed at the airport on the car rental. Even though we knew it was coming, we couldn't avoid it. Oh. <laughs> and then and that we just tried for hours, and I was just like, okay. And then, and then we got in a car accident that wasn't our fault. We got heavily rear-ended and the car got written off we got to spend five hours with mexican police and then and then my son got seriously sick and misdiagnosed and we you know and we're just kicking ourselves you know beating ourselves up so badly for not getting them to a hospital right away and not getting our correct diagnosis right away yeah that's not the recharge that you were looking for at all not not at all and, and i and i do want to say though if we're going to talk about mexico we love mexico and the people here have been really really great like you get out of the tourist zone and into what we call real mexico and we actually have the time of our lives in real mexico and even like the hospital staff here they're really genuine they're super caring um going i just keep thinking like oh man if we were in a hospital at home we would not be getting this level of like compassion and friendliness especially because they're speaking English, not their first language, <laughs> you know, and we're extra grouchy because we're sleep deprived and, you know, and I'm just going, okay, yeah, they're, they're really um, just not just in the hospital, but just all around, right? Like everybody's been really caring 
And that's one thing we love about Mexico and why we come here for the recharge is we find the culture is really, well, it's an indigenous based culture. It's like they're very family focused, very kids first, you know, like even in the car accident, we we're like, we couldn't believe like people just off the street stopped what they were doing and helped us for hours, Wow! like hours, you know, like uh, a neighbor came and helped us and like let us use his bathroom and gave us some support and then a, a a lady who's a lawyer came and just like could speak english and was translating for us and stayed for like longer than we did to make sure everything was taken care of and then she called her sister who's a pharmacist and came and guarded our bags on the sidewalks oh my gosh and then and then just like people like going by like somebody goes and grabs drinks and brings them like here do you want something to drink you know like uh, and we were, we just kept thinking, yeah, this would not happen in Canada. Like, like people would be like, it's someone else's job. Like, like just kind of put your blinders on and go by, by the accident scene. Um, so we actually felt like that was a silver lining for us was feeling like, yeah, this is, this is inspiring. Like, this is how we would like, um, our community to operate, you know, um, you know, people to operate in this caring way, like looking out for each other. And, 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 and I got to point out, this was just in a random area of the city that we got hit. This was not like some special <laughs> thing. So we, so I just wanted to point that out. Like to us, we're not, we don't blame Mexico. Like this was just bad, bad luck. Um, all happening in one trip. Everything went wrong. But, but yeah, but it, like you said, it, it's bringing it the best in, in other people. So that that's inspiring really right <laughs> you know to to see how other people yeah and and just another quick story the first doctor that we went to in mexico the first clinic they didn't charge us anything like they gave and they gave us prescription drugs in for free and we're like no we want to pay and they're like no 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 you don't pay and i'm like well i know mexicans pay like we, they told us they're like oh it costs this much for the doctor and they're like no not for you you don't pay anything so we, we, they wouldn't take our money. Yeah. So we, we bought them some, some, uh, refrescos like pot or sodas and, um, brought them and they were very grateful. But, but, uh, again, it's really unusual friendliness and helpfulness that we run into in in the most unusual places in this country. Like, so Jacob is a homeschooling parent. Are you going to greet your recovered child with a huge stack of things to catch up on? Or will you just go with? the life lesson being enough education for this oh 100 percent life lesson and that's what we're focused on with them they, they don't have like prepared assignments really like they they do but not not in like a paperwork sense uh the kinds of assignments we give them is is like what do you want to do with your life and what kinds of skills or knowledge do you need to have um and you need to go do that so my younger son right now he's working on his to-do list for the rest of the day and he's on a bit of a mission to go out and get some things done on his own here in Cancun. Uh, and so our older son, like a lot of what we've been focusing on with him have been what we call life skills, like, um, you know, budgeting, um, scheduling, um, planning ahead, communicating effectively. Can, like like we, before we came, we did a whole like homeschool lesson in the card to the airport on like marketing and sales and how to recognize like 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 when you're being sold something and the psychology of it so you can counter it if you want to so that's the kind of things we've been doing um the homeschooling we've done is is more typically called unschooling um but for us it's been uh, more of an indigenous model like a uh, indigenous model of education which is to focus on people's gifts or natural skills and abilities interests and really strengthen them and encourage them to go down that path rather than to make them do things they don't want to do. So our youngest son is um, a professional musician at age 15. He's very um, competent at uh, music. And our older son, who's in the hospital, is a competent professional mechanic on his way to being um, a red seal. So so um, to be a tradesperson, in Canada, there's certain trades that are red seal, which means you accomplish the red seal and you're recognized across the country as top tier in that trade. Uh, and it typically takes five to seven years if you do full time 
to get to get your red seal. If that's all you do, you live and breathe your trade and you go to college to do your coursework, you know, 24 seven, it takes minimum five years. Um, so for Noah, who's 17, he's already roughly year three um, out of his minimum five years. Um, so he's quite competent as a mechanic and he's on his way, on his way. And he has no interest in like, academics. He's never has. Um, so, so that's his journey. Um, so we basically have a musician artist, you know, is really good at design, math, music, things like that. And we have another who is uh, more mechanical and, and uh, is our farmer as well. He's really into plants and plant science. And... So listening to your interviews, and I'm, I'm rearranging some questions here. Um, I've also been listening to Temple Grandin's work about visual thinkers recently and thinking about, mm. I know what you had said in your interview about how few kids are really, or humans are really designed for desk work and learning, you know, in the, mm. the lecture model that we generally use and how pointless it really mm -hmm. seems to be to try to teach people in a way that they are not designed to learn in. If you could design magically, if Elon Musk gave you $50 bazillion or mm -hmm. whatever, to design mm -hmm. your ideal culturally and trauma-informed educational system, what would that look like for your community? Or in general, tell us your well, number in general, yeah, if I was like to reorganize your entire mainstream education system, the number one thing it would focus on is is building people's um, confidence in themselves um, and, uh, um, you know, focus on building maturity over time. As long with your biological development for maturity, there should be like a mental, emotional maturity development. And that that's number one. And the basic reason why is if somebody has that self confidence and that 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 inner mapping of themselves, they could not read or write until they're fourteen, and they'd still be fine because they could learn it so quickly because they have that confidence. And that's been proven over and over and over again um, that when folks, when people are have a love of learning, when they understand themselves, they learn very, very, very quickly. You know, we have in Canada, and the United States, examples of some very young university professors who didn't learn certain things until they're a teenager and, and then they just leapt forward really quickly. So number one for me would be uh, focusing on confidence because without the confidence, it's so hard to um, learn and gain skills. Um, and then I think uh, the second thing I would focus on is streaming people towards their interests. Uh, I think there's basic things everyone needs to know, like math, you know, um, Literacy, I think, is super important. Um, however, not everybody needs to sit at a desk holding a, a pen and writing on a piece of paper. Uh, to a certain degree, yeah, you got to be able to fill in forms. So that's what we do with our kids is like, okay, you need to be able to fill in forms. So that's the main main literacy piece. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I think the third thing that's critical as an employer is you we need problem solvers. Okay, so like you got the confidence you're gaining skills that you're in knowledge that you're, you're pulled towards. Um, the next thing is by the time you graduate from high school, you should be able to solve problems. You know, which I should be able to give you a problem. And, you should, and if you don't know how to solve it, you should be able to figure it out and do it. What we find at T Creek, which is the name of our training farm is people come in and they are so um, beaten into standing in lines, queues, waiting for permission like we still have adults who come and ask us to go to the bathroom you know like and so if you're asking permission to use the bathroom when you need to use the bathroom how can how are you going to just freely take problem solving steps and be like yeah i see a problem i'm going to solve it and so employers that they are going to value the problem solvers those are the people who are going to rise in the ranks no matter what kind of employment you're in um, you're going to be valued if you're a problem solver, especially in the information age, um, where it's so easy to solve problems. <laughs> we just can, if you, if you know how to Google, you know how to watch a YouTube video, um, you can learn anything. Like I had to, that's how I got my headset working today. I never used this set before. Googled it, you know, watched a YouTube video. Here I am. We're using this headset. So, um, in the information age, problem solving should be 
like second nature to everybody and, 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 and it isn't, um, everybody who comes to our programs, uh, we have to try and rebuild the confidence piece, um, which is often broken. Like people have been just beat down through the school systems in our area and in our part of the country. Um, and then, and then we have to build skills. <laughs> rebuild confidence, rebuild skills. And then the last but critically important piece is we need to start building proactivity and problem solving, which kind of go together. So I saw an early night promise. I'm going to let you get a word in edgewise eventually here. Um, I saw that your background is actually in computer science, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that something you're still using with your work or is that? Yeah, I should jump back to my childhood, which is I had um, parents who refused to let me use watch TV or uh, play play games, um, which is really weird when all your peers at school, all your friends have got like a Nintendo gaming system back then, and everybody's got endless cable TV back then, and uh, or satellite, and we didn't have my my. It was they were proactive about it. They would call the homes of where I was hanging out and be like, did Jacob watch any TV? And if I did, I was grounded sometimes for weeks. So, um, but that's the best decision my parents made, honestly, um, because it forced a ton of creativity. And my dad, I really wanted to play computer games. So my dad started teaching me computer programming when I was like nine, eight or nine years old. And he would let me play games if I made them, if I coded them. So uh, that's how I became a coder. Um, and I have not used that specific skill for a very long time. However, it really um, helped me solve problems. Um, and in my past businesses, it really helped them be cutting edge and on the technology side, like to save time, to save effort, you know, to, to be successful as a business. Um, and still to this day, it, it factors in a little bit into what we're doing at um, Tea Creek at the farm in that we're always looking at how technology can improve our workflows or productivity. For example, our crop planning, we do that all digitally, of course. Um, and we try and use platforms that minimize confusion and <laughs> communication, you know, where you just open your phone and be like, okay, this is what I'm doing today. It's all, it's all there. It's all right out of the crop plan. So yeah, it definitely has helped a ton. But I quit being a computer programmer a long time ago because I hated the culture of computer programming. It's very unhealthy culture in so many ways. So uh, I, I learned I'm not actually a uh, true pure nerd. I'm actually a people person. I thought I was like I was very low self-esteem as a kid, very introverted, struggled socially. And so I just thought computers are where I'm meant to be. It's just me and a computer and it's a safe space and this is who I am. And then when I took it in university, I realized once I hung out with a bunch of other coders and in this environment, I was like, wow, this is totally not who I am. I really want to solve problems. I really want to work with people. I really want to make people's lives easier. And that's not what the computer science um, coding culture was back then. It was like anti-social. <laughs> I'm um, actually a remote tech worker now, and I'm, I find myself fascinated by, with the pandemic, this increase in understanding of remote work mm -hmm. in rural areas and improved internet access, mm -hmm. what resources that can bring to folks like farmers, you know, just the, yeah. the income that that can bring into rural areas, um, you know, having that background. So you've talked a bit about your background, but from doing a bit of research, it seems like you actually have not all that many years worth of ag background. So how did you actually end up in this on a farm and teaching other people how to how to grow things? Yeah, I suffer from pretty severe imposter syndrome, let me tell you. I'm, I'm actually shocked at my profile that it rose so quickly. Um, so it's a bit of a long story. I'll try to make it short. So I was um, a consultant prior to being a farmer, and I was only a consultant for two to three years, um, working on business planning, feasibilities, negotiating, financing, things like that. Um, and we were living in a normal house in town, like double door garage, 
way too much space. And we had record flooding and wildfires in our part of the world back in 2017, 2018, which have now since been surpassed by bigger floods and bigger fires. But what happened is we had our power knocked out for a couple of days and with the flood, the floods so of the wildfires were cutting out power and the flooding was nearly wiping out major hydro power lines. And we devolved so quickly to cooking our food over a fire out in our yard. And I just was like, wow, we're like one day away from being cave becoming cavemen because in this nice house in town, you lose your power, you lose your water, you lose your sewer because the flooding was stopping the sewer system from working. We're, we're right back to, to being, you know, forest dwellers, uh, you know, cooking food over a fire. And, and I thought, this is crazy. It's crazy. We spend so much money to live in a false sense of security. This really is not secure at all. Um, both my wife and I grew up early. We both grew up with gardening parents and foods, preserving food, secure um, minded parents. So, uh, and we'd always had a plan to live rurally. So just this, this shock of, of, okay, becoming cavemen after one or two days, um, went, okay, we need a farm. We need some of our personal food security. Like we need to have food in our root cellar. We need to cook food when the power goes out, you know, um, have a water run without having to rely on the city. Um, so yeah, so we, we set a mission turned everything or like we had a property development business. We owned rental houses. We had our own house. We sold it all. My wife and I, we just did like a couple days of heart to heart visioning, planning, and just did a radical, I don't know what, like one, like I guess a 180 and sold everything and bought a farm. Um, and the farm was abandoned for nearly 15 years. Um, not super functional, but we were excited by that. We were like, our kids were like nine and 10, uh, perfect time to, to do this, you know? And so we lived in a cabin without running water for the first, um, six, seven months. Well, we got the little tiny farmhouse, which was only like 600 square feet, super tiny. So going from like 3000 square feet down to 600 square feet, uh, was amazing. It was, it was a real blessing to us. Like we, bonded as a family like for real um the kids learned how to haul water and boil it and wash dishes after every meal instead of using a dishwasher it was great um they, they, their interests just exploded and their confidence and their physical activity um but man the farm was a nightmare like we had to the fences were all basically destroyed like it was not where they were not worth reviving so we had to hire crews to come in and help us remove just endless amounts of fencing. Um, the buildings were not very functional. Um, and of course things were very overgrown and bears had claimed the farm in the 15 years of no humans living there. It was so funny. It was like, uh, and, and not just, we're not talking one or two bears. We're talking bears, plural, just chillaxing. It's like you imagine in a cartoon, like if we had a hammock, they would have been laying in the hammock in the front yard. It was so funny. Like they yeah. just, they, they were sharing the place with you. <laughs> it was a... It was their farm and we were the invaders. We were the invaders and we, unfortunately for them, you know, kicked them off the farm now. And so there's now no bears on the farm, but it was theirs. <laughs> yeah, we just we just got those fences just the way we wanted them. I'm picturing these poor bears sitting there and being like, do they know how hard we've worked to make it like this? We've spent 15 years getting it like this and they just, just finally ruined that just the way it was supposed to be. If I had a time machine, we probably would have delayed getting dogs because uh, the dogs are what scared off the bears. And our kids just loved having the wildlife around. Like it was so cool. And it was cool to learn this respectful, strong communication with bears and other wildlife. Cause we had like foxes, coyotes, ravens, but still we have the ravens still. We, made, we kept them. Um, they, they decided to tolerate us um, and, and bears and moose. But as soon as we got the dogs, they just chase everything away, including tried to chase the ravens away, but the ravens stuffed it out. So, um, yeah, because, uh, yeah, there's a plus side to dogs, right? Absolutely. And uh, But in hindsight, we're like, oh, I kind of liked having all that wildlife, and now it's gone, you know, off the farm. So You definitely have to be growing a few more crops, though, if all of those uh, wildlife were, were still sharing. 
sharing all over the land or not so much? No, no, not so much. So we actually don't have any active fencing around any of our field blocks to keep animals out or any, any measures to keep them out because um, our farm is surrounded by a healthy indigenous food forest. That So when we purchased the farm, we did not know that it is incredibly historically significant. So it uh, had probably been occupied for thousands of years prior to settlers arriving. Um, it was a crossroads of four significant indigenous highways met there. And, um, and we now know that um, there, there's a food forest that has kind of radiated from the farm. So what that means is you go into the forest and it is just everything that grows there is food everything so there's it's chock full of berries and fruits like wild cherries multiple varieties wild apples um you know blueberries huckleberries wild cranberries um uh, different species of willows that the moose eat so what's happening is the animals are basically like we got enough food in the forest like we're not gonna bother with this low quality stuff you guys are growing in the fields so so far we haven't had any issues we have deer and they don't touch our greens, you know. We've we've got bears that are known for you know loving carrots, and they don't touch our carrots, you know. So so um, it's been one of the things I've been pushing for for policy shifts in Canada is to start emphasizing the need for forest forest buffers, not just to protect against wildfires. So our our forest around our farm is like asbestos to fire. It, it it's so wet and. Um, uh, it, it, it will stop a wildfire in its tracks. Um, and uh, it also provides water. So critical groundwater um, because of the biomass there, it holds and retains and drives water into, into the aquifers. Um, and then it keeps the wildlife problems away. And the other thing is it allows us to be sort of in quotations organic. We don't need to use any um, pesticides because um, our farm is abundant in natural predators. Uh, it's crazy. And then you go into the forest and you're like, oh, this is where the predators are coming from. It's just chock full of spiders and hawks and uh, forest toads that will take out all our slugs. You know, we'll come in and they, 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 they're like, oh, we know where to go for the slugs. They come into our fields and eat them all and they go back to the forest. So it's a pretty good deal for us. You have a good, good healthy forest ecosystem around the farm and it just sort of takes care of you, takes care of the animals, takes care of your farm. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Nice deal. I saw a speech of yours the other day where you talked about this misconception that First Nations people were hunter gatherers and that agriculture mm -hmm. and being agrarian was not actually part of the culture. And that is something that, you know, the colonialists brought yeah. to North America. But I know, I mean, obviously you can't cover all of North America, but even in a regional context, can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about more about the agrarian roots of First Nations people? Well, it's really been an intense learning for me over the last year. We got hired by the Provincial Ministry of Agriculture to create a discussion paper on Indigenous um, agriculture for the government. And so I started researching and it completely, because like, at that point, I was still of the belief that a lot of First Nations were hunter-gatherers um, and that the farming sort of um, agrarian culture was more post-contact. And that's the narrative. However, it turns out it's 100% false and it's actually the reverse. So if you look at uh, contemporary facts from the time of the Mayflower, right, and, and going back to first Europeans coming to North America, um, they were actually very primitive in terms of field food production. Um, and they arrived to what's now the you know Caribbean and the Americas, like the Taino people where Christopher Columbus landed were 100% farmers. They were field farmers. They were uh, bean farmers. So like 80% of the world's edible beans today were developed, cultivars developed by indigenous people in the Caribbean and in Central America. And they were exporters. The Taino were a nation of millions of people on these islands, very wealthy by standards of the day. And that's what they, that's how they made their money in quotation marks is they, they exported beans. And it turns out this was all over the Americas, including in Ontario, where there's a lake in Ontario. It's last few years that they've been core sampling the mud at the bottom of the super deep lake. And they were shocked to find out that there's tons of uh, corn pollen 
um, deep down and that in First Nations people were actively farming corn uh, in this sort of quotations remote part of Ontario uh, long before Europeans arrived and uh, completely changing, you know, the image of what that part of Ontario must have looked like back in the day. Now, the tricky thing is, is so where we live, um, it's forested heavily now today. So you go there today and you look around, all you see is forests. Um, so it's easy to apply this modern bias of going, this is what it looked like 200, 300, 500 years ago. Um, and that would be false. Um, so uh, in our area, um, the valley that we are in was mostly fields. Um, and about 100, up until about 80 years ago, the keystone animal species, like large animals, was actually um, elk and deer. What I find so interesting is today people will go moose hunting and say that moose hunting is a traditional indigenous First Nations activity. Moose did not exist in our region until 80 years ago. So the main species was actually elk and the elk are now extinct and caribou, both of which are now extinct in our region. And those are plains animals so elk require a huge amount of grass to feed they're not foragers so what happened is colonists arrived displaced indigenous people off of the prime farmland and actually stopped farming they didn't farm and ranch the way indigenous people were pre-settlement pre-colonization and they let the forest grow in and that made the caribou and elk go extinct and the moose came in with the forest because the moose are the foragers. And this is 100% backed up by historical accounts in our area, including the government of um, Canada advertising 2 million acres of farmland in our region. And I can tell you that there's a mere fraction of maybe 1% or 2% of that 2 million acres left today. So... Um, yeah, so if you can imagine who created those 2 million acres, this is pre-industrial, this industrialization. This is before there was massive machines that could clear forests. Uh, this is back in the 1800s. Well, it was, of course, the original inhabitants. So it was indigenous people who had cleared it and who were maintaining it and producing food off it. Now, the trick is, is that when we think of farming today, we always think of it again with the modern bias, like we think tractors, we think barns, you know, we think uh, combines. And of course, all of that is very modern. Um, when we're looking at history, we need to look at contemporary versus contemporary. Um, and uh, back then, Indigenous peoples were practicing what we now call regenerative agriculture. So they were um, doing controlled burns to maintain the fields. Uh, that's what you did before <laughs> here, before you had machines. And that was introducing phosphorus and biochar into the soil. Um, and the burns were done depending on what crop you're growing. So um, the first settlement in BC was of Victoria. The Fort of Victoria was one of the first settlements. And then New Westminster were around the same time. And the first settlers in what's now BC on the West Coast took logs because they were surrounded by farmland. It is so interesting. Like I went and I found the original sketches that the first settlers made. And there was houses, big, beautiful, long houses, very well constructed, surrounded by field blocks. And the field blocks were delineated with irrigation ditches. Okay, so this is a very long time ago, and these were all 100% done by Indigenous people. The other thing I found so fascinating is that in what's now BC, they actually had a competition between Indigenous um, farming methods and food production methods and settler methods and documented the different tools and which one was more efficient and the Indigenous methods and tools won. And so the colonial government of British Columbia outlawed them and made them illegal. So um, you have this history of in Canada where the cornerstone of colonial policy became the destruction of indigenous food systems because as long as indigenous people were producing abundant amounts of food, they were wealthy. Okay, so what fed the people of Victoria were indigenous farmers and they became well off. There, you, there's photos of them wearing suits and top hats and rebuilding their homes in the Victorian style and 
they got cars and that was not acceptable because that was a threat, right? Because they were also saying you can't have our land. Like you can stay in your fort, but you can't have our land, you know? And, um, and that wasn't okay, you know, because um, the government eventually after a number of years wanted the land for free. So um, there was a number of strategies put in place across our country of Canada starting in 1888 that uh, were national policies designed to destroy Indigenous food producers. So just a quick overview of those. Uh, starting in 1888, you weren't allowed to own land. Um, so if you had, it was called the severance policy. So if you had more than 10, 20, 50 acres, depending on where you were, it was seized and removed and cut down to, to a small size. So that was severance. Um, so there were large cooperative indigenous farms of thousands of acres, tens of thousands that were seized and removed and sometimes cut down to the smallest size. Um, so that was severance policy, not allowed to own land if you're First Nations. Um, and then the next one that was really big uh, was called the peasant policy, which I just kind of talked about, which is you're not allowed to purchase any tools for farming. You're only allowed to use hand tools like shovels, rakes. And that was called peasant policy. And then the third one, and one of the most destructive, was called pass and permit, which is you weren't allowed to sell your food. So you could produce it with your hand, with your rakes and your shovels uh, on a small piece of land, and now you're not allowed to sell it. So what they uh, started to do is they started having workarounds. So initially it was limited to vegetables and field crops. And so Indigenous people became fishermen, commercial fishermen. They became ranchers, like some very, very wealthy, very large ranches in British Columbia. There's one over 20,000 acres in the interior of BC. And the Indigenous owners of that were the equivalent of today's multi-multi-millionaires. And it was seized. Um, so they expanded this policy in 1951 to crack down on all these little, little exit loopholes that First Nations food producers are finding like, okay, I can't field, field uh, grow food, but I can, I can, I can ranch still. I can, I can have my herd of cattle and I can, I can roam them in the mountains and I can make money or I'm a fisherman and I can have a, a fishing boat and I can fish, you know? And so they expanded that to say, okay, you can fish, but you can't have a motor on your boat, which actually, so 2014 was when the peasant policy was finally officially repealed and taken off the book. So the legacies of these laws are deeply embedded in Canadian society today to the point where Indigenous peoples are nowhere near represented in agriculture um, and where large institutions like banks still have anti-Indigenous policies, even though the federal laws don't exist on the books anymore, the, they still exist within these different institutions like your local tractor dealership may not sell you a tractor because of peasant policy. They, the bank won't lend you money, right? Because of severance and pass and permit. Um, so when we bought the farm, I bought it cash. I knew I wouldn't be able to get a bank loan for it. We had to sell everything else by the farm. And it was, I didn't realize that it was an act of resistance be, until people started showing up almost immediately in droves, indigenous people so excited that a local indigenous person had bought a farm it was incredible it was uh I, we thought we were going to be unnoticed you know off in the sticks and instead we became this lightning rod <laughs> and people started traveling from far away to come to our farm like they started traveling like hundreds of miles like to come it almost became like a pilgrimage people to come it's like the first indigenous owned farm in how long be like past memory um that's off the reserve so i'm wondering at least in the states i think you know a lot of us grew up with the the crying indigenous guy on the, the tv commercial you know of the the pollution and the, the crying indigenous man i think there's such for for white americans certainly there's such a an idea that indigenous people are somehow like mystical fonts of mm -hmm. ancient wisdom right and that you know given the chance just all this 
mystical whatever will just fly forth in a you know a tremendous avalanche of wolves and dream catchers and teepees and shit i don't know yeah, yeah because yeah. also all native people you know dream catchers wolves teepees across the board yeah one thing what is it along with your your magical school mm -hmm. what would revitalizing those traditions look like for you because i think it's so easy to forget that those are mm. living things and that if they're not mm -hmm. used they die the language the traditions yeah. the whatever for me a lot of my mission uh, so a lot of my vision is about resiliency self-sufficiency like interdependency bringing back what i call like our old economies you know and not just indigenous but around the world you know we we often forget that the world is fed by small scale producers, small to medium scale producers, by and large. And really, North America, Canada, the United States is a global anomaly for our massive industrial complex farming. Because most of the world, they don't have the luxury of so much land and so much money and so few people. Um, so when I travel to other countries, like I am now, I'm always inspired. I always come back like, oh, yeah, we need more of this, you know, and I'm and um, so most of the world is fed by small to medium scale producers and um, your local communities. I always say like, you know, Canada, the United States, we're in trouble, right? Because our local community resiliency by and large across the board is really poor. You know, those supply lines get cut off. We're in deep trouble. Whereas, whereas rural Mexico, even ur urban Mexico is going to be fine. You know, like Europe, they're going to be fine. Like we went to Europe last year. Every single town is surrounded by an insane amount of local food production and, um, low, and, and from every level, primary, you know, production level. So for, for me, it's been bringing that back, like, like bring back that whole economy in your small local community. And for me, it's indigenous focused hundred percent because we had that as indigenous peoples everywhere and it was stolen. Um, so that's my vision. And then in terms of the mission and getting there, um, a lot of it is restoring for me personal sovereignty because as indigenous people, um, that's been stolen through so many generations. Like you didn't have a choice. You had to give up your children at age four to six and then you might never see them again. You know, you, you, your choices in life as an indigenous person in Canada have been so severely limited even to today, that I want to see those walls broken so that an Indigenous person can decide what is their culture and what is their future and what is their family going to look like for the first time in over 100 years. Um, so that's my thing, as I don't want to prescribe, like, this is how you need to be to be Indigenous or First Nations. It's like, I want you to decide what that means. I want you to decide if that means we're bringing back your language or revitalizing it, or if it means going out on the land or not. Maybe it means becoming an accountant and making a bunch of money like everybody else, because why not? You should be able to do that. Um, so that's, that's my drive. And then, yeah, in terms of the mystical Indian stereotype, it's pervasive um, and it's deeply rooted in racism as well. Like, um, because if you look back again, a contemporary record, the word chief, for example, somebody asked me, and they're like, is the word chief offensive to you? And I was like, no. And, and, uh, and so I researched it, and I was fascinated to find out that the word chief to describe an indigenous leader of like a tribe or nation is a really modern word. And that prior to that, they were called emperors or kings or queens, uh, essentially uh, equal to um, European monarchs and leaders and it wasn't until the late 1700s early 1800s that that the word chief started to be used and as a way of degrading indigenous people uh, and taking them away from being equals and so i've learned that yeah up until relatively modern history um first nations indigenous people were seen as equals more or less as nations and rights and human rights as human beings and that it's really been a, a modern um um reality to have indigenous people be degraded and be subhumanized and part of that is becoming the mystical indian that has wise and lives in the forest or lives in a teepee i find that stuff fascinating because you look back and you go they weren't living in teepees 
<laughs> um, and you know, like they were living in these gorgeous handmade houses, you know, they, they were just that are gone now. But, but anyway, so um, the other thing I'll say is, is I do have experience in the United States as well. So when I was 14, I spent a summer traveling around to different tribes in the United States and got a pretty decent feeling and sense of, of, um, you know, realities, um, south of the border. Um, and one thing I really appreciated in the United States versus Canada is that at least the genocide was at the top of people's minds. Like even if for white Americans, it's like, yeah, we know about the trail of tears. We know about the massacres. We know about the failed treaties and, and, you know, even like with, Standing Rock in the modern times, um, you know, there is a real sense of injustice in the American um, mainstream. Um, so you had like veterans like showing up to support Standing Rock. That never happens in Canada because in Canada, uh, our indigenous history has been totally hidden. And a myth has been created that Canada was much better to indigenous people uh, and that indigenous people were sort of protected or coddled or whatever. And it's actually the opposite. If you look at the facts and the statistics and the numbers, Indigenous people in Canada die at much higher rates than any other population in North America. They die much younger from preventable deaths. Living standards are the lowest of any um, cultural you know, group in North America. So if you're Indigenous in Canada, um, socioeconomically, you're below Black Americans, you're below Indigenous First Nations Americans in the United States, and you truly are living in third world conditions where you're totally denied land, you're totally denied uh, any equal opportunity, you can't go to a bank and get a, a loan. Um, like my wife became my banker very early on because despite stellar credit and successful businesses, I could not get a single financial institution to give me a loan. Uh, she walked in there with, with much worse credit um, lower income and she could walk out of there with $50,000 within like less than an hour. And so, uh, when I needed money, um, before she became my wife, she's my girlfriend. She's separate from me. She'd go in, borrow the money, lend it to me. I'd pay her back and she'd go pay back her loan. And that's the reality in Canada. Like it's ridiculous. Um, and it's made very difficult that today, um, Canadians still are abiding by this myth, you know, that the cracks are showing like the graves at the residential schools really shocked the Canadian psyche, like what, you know, but if you're indigenous, it didn't surprise you at all. It's something we grew up knowing about. Right. Um, so I think there's crack showing up in the Canadian psyche of uh, that, um, is actually false, um, and makes things very difficult to recover from if you're indigenous in Canada. Um, because not only do you have these systemic, um, structural barriers to move forward, you also have systemic racism that's pervasing everywhere, telling you that you should be grateful, that you've got an easier life, that the government gives you free money. All of that is false, factually 100% false. The fact is Indigenous Canadians get on average three quarters, like 75 cents to the dollar that a non-Indigenous Canadian gets for government services across the country. Some places it's lower than that. So um, it's, there's just a lot of this myth that just keeps the, um, the, the genocidal experience of Indigenous people a modern reality because we have people dying um, young, preventable deaths at incredibly high numbers in this country. I find that really interesting what you're saying too because as an American, I feel like we were more shocked by the residential schools because we knew we were terrible. But Canada is mm -hmm. supposed to be this, like, everybody has health care and can be decent mm -hmm. to each other and, you know, mm -hmm. has hockey and donuts and whatever. I don't know. Like, <laughs> you know, the... All, all those are true. The health care, the hockey, the donuts are 100% true and fair stereotypes. But, you know, I, I just going to want to be clear, like, I don't like comparing, but the just the statistical, the number, like the factual realities are there. And, and I wouldn't say the United States is better. It's just less, perhaps, horrible. Which if you're an indigenous, for, you know, uh, American listening, you're going like, what? My life is horrible. Yeah, it's, it's horrible there too. It's just that in, in Canada, there's, there's, there's this added, these added layers of structural racism and propaganda 
um, that uh, are extra challenging um, for Indigenous Canadians to navigate. Um, so my visits to the United States actually give me a lot of hope, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm so thankful I have the privilege of being able to travel and, and have that perspective and um, go, yeah, it was like genocide happened in the United States for Indigenous people 100% and, and still going on in many places as well. Um, and being an Indigenous American, statistically, you, again, you're like below Black Americans. It's, it's a really, really, really um, hard uh, country to live in. So uh, if you're Indigenous. And I will say, for me and my family, we so many times wanted to go to a different country. That's how bad it feels. However, I feel a greater obligation to stay, you know, because of my blood connection and my community and, and this mission um, and vision that we have. So, so I'm not in a hurry to, to leave, but, but I got, I got to say sometimes like, you know, I, we're down in Mexico and we're like, oh my God, it's so much, so much more possibility being indigenous here. Um, so, so fewer barriers, more rights, um, you know, intact language and cultures. Um, uh, but I, I would never, I'd never, uh, up and move to Mexico, but it, it inspires. So. We come back and we're like, okay, what can we bring back from United States or Mexico mm -hmm. or these other places in the world and, and uh, use as part of revitalizing what we're, we're doing back home with our training farm. Yeah. So can you tell us more specifically about the programs that you're running, the training that you're doing um, yeah. and what that looks like kind of day to day and on, a, on an annual basis even, you know, like yeah, what, your, what your, your farm looks like? So the best thing is that I went into this not an educator, like having no idea what an educator is supposed to do. <laughs> and um, so what happened is all this excitement around Jacob Beaton's a farmer now, local indigenous people showing up, people coming from cities and towns and quite far away to come visit our farm. And one day a nation brought a bunch of people for a day and I just said it's just gonna be a regular farm day like at that point we didn't have any programming it was just farming and they said we just want to tag along they brought like over 20 people and we just did a normal day on the farm and they could either join in or not or just watch like there's no pressure and at the end of the day they said this is the best day we ever had you know there was a 60 year old ish woman um, whose childhood dream was to drive heavy machine and we have a really old, like 1970 something backhoe on the farm. And she had basically played with that toy when she was a kid. And she's fairly disabled and, and um, you know, but I'd said, hey, do you want to drive? Do you want to operate it? I need to move it. It was on my to-do list that day. I'm like, I got to move it from here to there. And then I'm going to use it to do this. I was like, I'll teach you how to drive it. So I taught her how to drive it. And you could not, you've never seen a bigger, brighter smile of, a 60 year old woman who has uh, just lived her dream she's had since a child and never been able to experience it. Um, so end of that day, we just got this incredible feedback. Like we've learned more here than in any of the other programs we're in. We had the best day, you know, it's life changing. I was like, really? Like it's just a day of farming, <laughs> but against the background I explained. I made you pick weeds and this is the best day of your life. <laughs> yes, totally. And against the background of what I just explained, picking weeds for somebody is a huge privilege because that was basically illegal as in, you know, in Canada, like to do farming. And, and so for a lot of them, it brought back these memories of being with their grandparents and their grandparents had some of the last small scale farms. Um, so, uh, so the coordinator said, uh, would you consider someday us paying you for this. And I was like, well, I don't know. Like, you know, and then he told me how much they pay colleges. So the first nations, you have to pay the college for their people to go to college. And I almost fell over. It was so much money. I had no idea. And he said, we pay you um, because we're just sending them for kind of basic life skills, trade introduction to trades, like pretty entry level stuff that we're sending and paying this ridiculous amount of money for. So I parked that idea in the back of my head. And then the pandemic hit. I couldn't travel anymore, took that idea out of the back of my head and turned it into the training farm, Tea Creek, and I put a lot of thought into it. And it's worked out pretty much exactly how we planned it to go. And um, it's taken off. So 
the whole idea is that we are land-based, so there's no classrooms. Um, we are culturally safe. So that means free of racism, free of gender violence, free of, um, you know, uh, violence period. Uh, we want people to feel safe being themselves as indigenous people. And that's because so often as indigenous people, we have to meet these, like you just talked about, like the mystical Indian expectation or the hunter gatherer myth, you know, and, and so it kind of upsets people when you show up and you're like, I want to learn about science, you know? And so for us, we're like, you can learn about whatever you. <laughs> Jacob, you're not letting people drive cars to this, right? They are like required to ride war ponies with like their teepees and their dream catchers and shit. Like that's right. Yeah. <laughs> total, total. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you got it. So, uh, and I just wanted to point out, I find I, part of the reason I accepted the invitation of the podcast, I'm like, we're the minority in this, in this economy, like in Canada, uh, your average farmer is 60 years old, male and white, right? And so here, two non-male and one indigenous male, and and as indigenous people, we're minority, minority, minority. So, um, cultural safety is the next thing. Um, uh, so land-based, uh, culturally safe. And then we focus everything around indigenous food sovereignty. So all the training programs, it isn't just farming and food production. It's all the supporting skills that you need to run an operation. Like we need people who know how to irrigate and hook up plumbing systems. And we need electricians and we need carpenters to build things. We need mechanics. Oh my gosh, do we need mechanics, you know, to fix, fix uh, engines. We need people to prepare food and cook it and preserve it. Uh, we need bookkeepers, <laughs> you know, we need somebody to keep the books and we need planners. And 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 so um, we do training in all of those areas and we try to do them as simultaneously as possible. So it's all real world experience. So you're fixing an engine that just broke down in the field. You know, you're replacing a hydraulic line that just blew right now and we need it fixed so we can keep harvesting. Um, so that person who's fixing it is they're learning. And the person who's running the machine is learning. And the person who's who's handling the harvest and processing it, they're learning. They're all students and they're all learning. Um, so that's how it works in a nutshell. Um, it took off. It, like, oh my goodness, did it take off. I thought we would do like 20, 30 people a year. Our first year, our first program was a youth program. It was funded for 25 youth. We had 75 sign up to participate. And we served 40 something, I think 45 ish youth in that program. And then through the main growing season, we had an adult program and we were funded for about 30 adults. And we had another 75 adults show up and we served about another 50 or so um, adults through came in for training. Um, so that first year was about 150 enrollments complete. Uh, between the youth and the adults. Yeah. And that was like totally exhausting. <laughs> if you're only funded for that many and you're serving that many more, where's the, where's the difference coming from? We have a saying. Yeah. So it's coming from our life savings that she completely exhausted getting this up and running. Um, we were on the verge of not having money in the bank. Uh, we were about a few weeks away from, um, insolvency uh, early this year um, because we completely exhausted our savings. Um, and my wife has a saying, which is we turn every dollar into $5 on the farm, <laughs> which again, I think a lot of farmers, ranchers, food producers are familiar with this magic trick that you have to do. Um, and so last year we had 183 people come through um, and we were like, oh my goodness, this is totally nuts. And we were funded for 50 last year. So 50 and we had 183 and, um, we weren't able to get to them all. Like we, we, we worked with, I think 120 something, um, with the funding for 50. And part of that is we don't want to turn people away. Like we've operated what we call an open door model. Like you can show up, we'll get you in our system. We'll do the best we can. Um, and then this year, uh, we thought, okay, I did the math. And I did like a rough population of a regional population. And I was like, okay, like 180 is kind of the top that we can expect. And this year we have 300. So 
And then, and then last year we won the land award, BC land award. We won the, got selected by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization as Canada's food hero. And then they called us back and they're like, actually you're North America's food hero now. Um, you're representing Canada and the United States. And I was just like, what the heck? After two years, like we're getting all these crazy recognition. And I got appointed to the minister's advisory committee on regenerative agriculture at BC as somebody who's only been farming for a few years. It was kind of super crazy. Um, but what I've learned is that, and, and I hope I don't insult too many people with this, but they're just what seems to be happening is there's just not a lot of innovation, true innovation happening in the education system. So our, what we're doing is seen as being revolutionary and it is our success rates are off the charts. So what that means is people who go through our training come in incredibly high barrier. So our enrollments this year, 80% face what we call a deal breaking barrier, meaning they would not be able to, attend a job or school without a direct intervention. So for example, no money, no clothing, no food in your shelves, no way to get from your house or where you're living, if you're homeless, uh, to this place you need to get to. So 80%. On the other side of our training programs, we have this 80% success rate, meaning 80% are going and getting a job, going to school or starting their own business successfully. The, the mainstream education success rate is like 10 to 20% if you're doing everything right. So for us to have 80% is revolutionary. It, it, it is, it is uh, and it's being, and that's part of the reason for this is that um, we are overseen by a, a government agency. And after our first year, I went to report to them on how many indigenous people we had engaged and trained in trades. And this is where ignorance is bliss because <laughs> we're just like hauling ass, turning $1 into $10. And I show up and I'm like, here's how many people we worked with this year, indigenous people. And they gasped, they gasped. Like, I was like, what? And they said, uh, you just doubled our indigenous numbers for the whole province, i.e. state for the year at your one location. <laughs> I was like, what? So I guess other other educational institutions are doing a really, really bad job of, of working with Indigenous people if one farm in the sticks uh, can double the numbers for the province. Um, so so that's been a, um, a double-edged sword for us, for sure. Like, I think I would have preferred to stay under the radar. And I, that was actually my plan, was to stay under the radar for like five years and just do this quietly. So it's really pushed us into this insane growth that's really unhealthy. It's really hard on the kids. Um, it's really hard on, you know, husband and wife relationships. Um, it's, you know, uh, degrading in many ways. And it's also made us a target for um, wealthy institutions who are like, we want the secret sauce, like, and we want it for free. So, um, yeah, so it's been, it's been wonderful, but it's been exhausting. We've paid a heavy price financially and personally. Um, part of this trip that I'm on now was to kind of recharge the batteries and rebuild some of the family relationships that have suffered as a result of this insane um, growth and sort of success. Yeah, I, I can, on the very tiny scale, you know, like I know being on a farm that, that, having a, a some kind of a boundary between work and family is challenging and we do not <laughs> interact with even a fraction of the number of people and and having an open door policy while that's great for other people mm -hmm. i imagine is probably not always the best for for your no. immediate family well, it's so hard for us it's so hard for us arlene like we 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 decided we decided a couple times to implement a closed door like you can only come if you're registered and we accept you like we interview you or something and say yeah okay you can come and then we cried thinking about you know yeah just thinking about the lives that we've saved and the people who've come to us and it's not just one or two people it's uh quite a number of people have come and said you saved my life or you saved the life of somebody i know so we just kind of like cried like like 
we can't like no like what if we turn someone away and find out they're they're dead you know and that they would have been alive if they were able to come to the farm so so each time we've made the decision we've, we've, we've relented and like oh no we can't you know so so we're in a really tough spot right now um and we're like this every year we have no money lined up really like nothing that we could run our programs based off of um and so despite all of our uh, numbers and success which is acknowledged we just really struggle to get funded from anywhere and it's um and so we're only funded on these little snaps right like this one contract here one contract there um and i thought naively that after a couple of years of showing and keeping the data and proving that it's working that the government at least would come forward and be like, yeah, here's a fair contract, you know, like you're, you're, you're delivering this um, service that we value and we pay for in the mainstream at a very high rate. Um, so here's some money and that's not happened. Um, and then I shifted my time and energy to the private sector because there's all this talk of reconciliation with indigenous people. And also the elephant in the room is in the agriculture sector is the shortage of farmers and workers in agriculture in Canada, which is fallen off a cliff, like um, uh, five to seven, what I was reading in the stats, Canada numbers, five to seven farmers lost a day on average in this country and projecting a complete collapse of the food producing economy within 10 years. If that isn't, you know, satiated or slowed somehow. Um, and so I thought, Hey, you know, we've got the solution. Indigenous people, we want to get back to land. We want to grow food again. We want to produce food again. And we want to do it now. Um, and so I thought I'd be met with some excitement from the public and private sectors who make money based off food. And um, and neither has panned out yet. Like, it's it's been... Um, I'm kind of like, there's urgency now. Like, you guys should be showing up now because if you hit go now, it takes time to go, Right. And it's yeah. going to take years to train people. And so if we start now, it's going to take us a year to maybe get everything reset up again because I had to lay off all my staff. It's going to take us time to get up and going. And then it takes time to train people. Like how long does it take people to learn how to produce food, right? And run a farm or a ranch or food production of any kind. It takes years and years. Um, so, yeah, so that's our struggle right now is we're in the same boat as we were the last a um, couple of years, no funding, and they went like nothing on the radar. Um, and so we, what we decided is we're going to run something this coming year. It'll probably be very small scale, um, and uh, and we'll figure it out. But it, we're, we're definitely going to operate. It's just it's just we're still pulling together the pieces and, mm -hmm. and trying to make make it happen. I know <laughs> I don't completely understand how. Um, the the government and and um, First Nations interact in terms of finances, but I'm assuming, mm -hmm. based on what you've said before, that there are a lot of barriers there too in terms of what people are allowed to spend money on and mm -hmm. what are kind of approved approved projects and all of that kind of stuff. So it, it's all tied into that. Yeah, all the barriers that exist in lots of other ways. One very quick example: if you're First Nations. Uh, or indigenous, you're only allowed to claim 10% uh, what they call administrative costs on a project. And if you're non First Nations, you can claim up to 25% from the same funder. Right. Yeah. Because so. you don't need to like collect any data. Yeah. Or pay, pay bookkeepers or have office staff and all. Yeah. Your magical <laughs> administration just, it just happens. Yeah. I didn't know that magical efficiency was uh, an indigenous <laughs> thing too, but that's. That's good to know. Yeah, yeah, it is. That's that's another skill. Yeah, that's what my dream catchers do. They do all my books for me. <laughs> well, your dream catchers should be able to just catch the data as it flies by, right? Like get some sort of yeah, <laughs> yeah. digital oh, dream catcher man. situation going on. All all I could do is laugh. Honestly, like you, you, you I get angry, but then it's like I'm going to kill myself with anger. But um, so, anyways. <laughs> well, and I'm I'm sorry because I can't even envision the frustration that comes with reparations and the government has lots of energy for taking children away and killing people but not for helping anybody and it's it's really easy to 
to interview folks and give them awards, but obviously doing anything takes takes more. Yeah, and the thing, my frustration is this is a win-win, right? Like you have more, in, like we have an, a whole economy, agricultural economy that needs people desperately. And we have the only um, part of Canadian population that's growing, which is the Indigenous population. The only other part is... And the young, the youngest too, right? You know, like, a, yeah. By far, yeah, average age 22, you know. Um, and the only other se- segment of Canada that's growing is immigrants. So um, it's either indigenous or immigrants. And right now the government's like, oh, we'll take immigrants, please, you know, <laughs> for $100. So, um, and again, I'm not anti-immigrant at all, but I'm just kind of like, we've got a Canadian solution uh, that really needs this. And you got a country that needs it. And they're like, no, thanks. Like, I think we'll just keep wasting billions of dollars on other things um, that aren't going to work. So when I've been talking with government, I'm like, I would like to have like a competition, please. Like, I'd like to put forward uh, our indigenous proposal and have it compete head to head with whatever you're working on. Um, and they're just kind of like, yeah, nah, you know? So yeah, that's the reality right now. Yeah. Have you done your dragon's den pitch yet? I did actually, I, I did actually yeah. did a dragon's den. Not, I didn't get to the TV show stage, but I did sure. a pitch. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. they don't tell you why they say no, but they, 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 they didn't say yes to, to me doing the dragon's den thing. Yeah, and it was yeah, it, it was very interesting because I was like, um, we are like I'm 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 looking to go do the what's it called the backdoor thing now. Like I'm I'm like okay, so maybe what we need is just enough of the public to see this and push for it at this point because we're we're not having luck. Like we've gone all the way to the top, right? Like of uh, federal ministries and government and provincial. Um, some of the talk to some of the biggest companies in Canada. Uh, and so now it's kind of like okay. They just, they're mostly all talk, no action. Um, not all of them. We've, we've had some success, but uh, maybe we still got to get to the public now and, and get some push from the public because, but that's a trick and that's a risk. So there is a documentary that's coming out um, nationally in Canada on Cheat Creek that'll air in uh, July or August of uh, 2024. And we'll see. We'll see if that changes, changes our fortunes. Yeah. I'm just going to switch us over to our parenting side because I feel like we could probably talk. We could know. I'm just thinking like I know that I could talk for hours more. Um, so but I know that you have a lot going on <laughs> in Mexico. You probably have other things that you want to be doing today. So um, I'm just going to loop over to some of our the questions that we always end up asking people about parenting and farming at the same time. So um what is your favorite part about having kids on the farm and raising kids on the land? Oh gosh. Um, so my favorite part of raising kids on a farm or the land is seeing their confidence, um, just take off. Like we lived in this big home in town and the kids just seemed scared, you know, like it was hard to get them to be independent. Um, as soon as we moved to the farm, it was like a, we were worried that they were going to have a hard transition, but it was especially at that young age, it was like flicking a switch. They just exploded with confidence and, and interests. Um, physical fitness was a big thing that they gained as well, right? Like when you're out there working, that's hard work. And, and uh, so uh, that was a, the big thing. Um, I think it does a lot for discipline. Um, you know, it just has to be done. Like whatever the weather, whatever the conditions, you just got to do it. Um, the downside for us has not been farm related. It's actually was, um, related to phones and screens and social media is, uh, a few years ago, we decided it was, they're old enough to have their own phones. And that was handy for us parents to start letting them go off the farm and hang out with friends and know where they are and be able to reach them and things like that. And that was like our biggest parenting mistake. Um, and it was for me, I was like, I don't want to be them to be what I was, which is that weird kid. Everybody else has a phone. Everybody else has got Snapchat. And you're the one weird sore loser who doesn't have one. And I remember that from when I was a kid and it really hurt. So, um, and we held off what, what we felt like was forever. However, don't do it. If, if, you, if you're the parent who's, who's withheld and you're going, okay, they're old enough, they're 12 or whatever, don't do it, man. Like you can't win. Um, it's just like the, 
Um, every app, every social media platform is designed to completely outgun you as a parent and it works. And uh, our kids went from these active, you know, we're doing projects on the farm, doing really cool stuff to sitting on their butts, you know, like I'd be like, oh, they're working in the barn. I'll go see what they're doing. I go in and they're like, you know, it's, you can't see me head down, you know, the, the caveman looking at the screen, the, you know, the posture. And, um, and so it's been a real struggle this year to, uh, we've had to go cold Turkey was the only thing that we're, we tried so many things to correct it over the years. And for our boys anyways, um, the only thing that's worked is going cold Turkey, completely removing them and, uh, letting them read, allowing them to rediscover life outside of the screen and, and social media apps. Um, the big thing to find that the social media platforms that they are on, like TikTok and, and Snapchat and stuff, um, really amplifies negative themes and, and their mental health was going downhill. And so hearing the language they were saying was so weird. Being homeschooling parents, I'm like, where are you? Like they started actually seeing that it really snapped it for me where I just kind of like the angry bear came out which they made a really racist joke um, and they both made it like in the same day. And I was just like, where is this coming from? You're definitely not learning it from your mom and dad. You're not going out and hanging out with a bunch of kids your own age, like, like, uh, and they're learning it off social media. And so it was kind of funny seeing, you know, trying to educate them about like, you know, the straw man, red herrings, um, uh, dog whistles. So like, like they're kind of it's like seeing them being pulled towards becoming um what's the word like misogynist and you know it's just like oh man this is freaky you know like you know coming from matrilineal culture the last thing i want to see is my boys becoming misogynist so um but the racist joke thing really snapped it for me and i was just like okay that's it you know um and uh and then also the misogynistic behavior like there was an incident with uh a female over texting and you know one of my boys called her the b word and i was just like that was it for we're, they're gone you're not having your phones anymore guys you know and it was like flicking the switch again took the phone away and sure they hated it and there was a lot of kickback but it's like we got our kids back after that you know like we got our kind you know s smart hard-working young men um who care about other people it was just crazy it was like who uh, you know, my musician son started playing tons of music and be writing songs and becoming super creative. And, you know, my older son started like working on a bunch of projects again. And um, so, yeah, that was that was the biggest, biggest challenge for us. So um, would I do the farm thing again? Yeah. Our only regret is we didn't do it sooner um, when the kids were even younger. Um, but we're really happy we did it and they were still preteens uh and that uh they agree with that like it's interesting hearing them talk to people about their experience and them saying yeah this is like super great that we bought the farm and moved there and started farming are there other programs that you run um outside of your own family for children like are there are there things that are i wish <laughs> yeah <laughs> we do them on our own we do them on our own like we sell we, sell, we 100 right yeah you're already doing a million things, so. Yeah, we but we self-fund them. Like, we do sliding parties in the winter, which are a big highlight, and we just open up the farm to whoever wants to come, anybody, any, you know, any age. Not just kids, but, of course, we hope that you bring kids or, you know, but you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. And we set up sliding runs down our hills on the farm, and we use our tractors to tow people up. And, yeah, it's like, it's a, it's a big fun time, and light bonfire, and cook food over the fire. So we do things like that, um, but I would love to do formal children's programming. It's just um, we don't have any support for it, so um, it's all informal when when it is done. Katie, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'm. I feel a little unqualified to even ask this as the one who has small children instead of teenagers. But how do we help? teenagers and the rest of the world realize and younger kids too i guess how powerful and incredible children can be you know children and young adults because i mean my kids already come up with 
the craziest, most creative things. And teenagers, for all the passion they can have for mm. things we might wish they didn't, um, you know, when they're they're on the track of something they're interested in, that level of interest mm -hmm. and flexibility and dedication and energy, honestly, is incredible. And I'm just wondering how you see going forward in the world to really get the rest of the world to appreciate what young people can bring to it. Because I feel like there's such a an anti-teenager sentiment oh, yeah. generally. Yeah, which... I, I don't know if I have the answer to that. I, we struggle with our own um, teenagers. You know, they've, they've had such a privileged life compared to, to my childhood that I often feel like a fish out of water as a parent. Um, you know, even just like being taking them on vacation to another country, I'm like, this wasn't even a distant fantasy when I was a kid and definitely not a reality. Um, so it's, it's kind of fresh and new and we make mistakes. Um, with our kids, I think the thing we miss is for me anyways, I wish we had more children, like, like having two is, is, is a pretty small family for us. Or for me, anyways, my wife's happy with two. That's all she wanted was two. But yeah, you know, we always joke that that our gender should be reversed because I want a lot of kids and I want to like cook and I want to, you know, um, parents and I love it. I truly love being a parent. And and she's kind of wants to do business and you know, um, you know, not 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 so much the parenting responsibilities. Um, but of course it's harder for her being a woman, like there's fewer opportunities. So I'm the one that by default, who gets to be the breadwinner. Um, so I think, I think when I look in culturally, I see that teenagers and kids who value children are ones who are raised or growing up around kids all the time and have, and are kind of gradually going into roles of caring. And so we see that with a lot of, um, you know, indigenous people who come to our farm or raised in multi-family households with lots of people and so there's sort of a much more natural caring loving environment um and there really isn't these hard lines between like kid teenagehood adulthood there's kind of it's much more fluid um the other thing um all i was going to say is uh there's some things i think my wife would want me to mention about the farm and children and that is that we notice in, in the culture where we are, the Indigenous culture, um, there's so much less emphasis on your personal appearance, um, which applies to genders as well. So there's less emphasis on gender. Um, there's So you're not expected to dress pretty if you're female. You know? You're not expected to be a tough guy if you're a man. Um, and that's something we've realized running our programs and that we don't realize until we go outside of them into the mainstream culture. Like my wife's like, oh my God, I, I forgot I'm supposed to wear makeup and do my hair nice. And, and I'm like, oh my God, I forgot I'm supposed to like walk straight and like be like this, <laughs> you know, stick up my chest and, 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 and ignore people and act like I don't care about anybody. So we always feel this real sense of relief going back to the farm, going back to our programs where people are um, loved and welcomed. All the things that we probably wish <laughs> were more universal, right? That we don't don't pi pigeonhole anyone into those roles that they maybe don't want, just based on what they they seem to present as. Yeah, Katie, I'm wondering since we're having some internet issues, if we should kind of start to to wrap up and let uh, let Jacob figure out <laughs> what his next few days are going to be like. So, Jacob, we ask all of our guests. If you were going to dominate a category at the county fair, real or made up, whatever, what would it be? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, I'm known as the potato guy locally, um, so it would probably be potatoes. Um, and I'm starting to get into squash now. Um, my son, Noah, my older son. The game or the plant? <laughs> the plant, for sure. <laughs> I'm terrible at the squash game. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we, we, we basically love, I love any crop that's like indigenous, like tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, squash, corn, and then of course all of our localized uh, varieties of fruits that grow in our area. Um, so big fan of, of the indigenous crops, but I'm known as the potato guy and uh, I'm starting to really enjoy squashes as well. 
So I will go ahead and move us into our cussing and discussing segment. So for listeners, you know that you can submit a cussing and discussing on our speak pipe yeah. or by email. You can check the show notes for the links to those. Um, Katie, what are you cussing and discussing this week? Arlene, we're, uh, we're moving into winter here in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, boots. There are so many fucking boots everywhere. You cannot open or close a door anywhere in the first, like, 50 feet of our house without tripping over boots. The kids each have two pairs of boots, you know, one for school, one for the farm. My husband has a couple pairs. I have a number of pairs of boots. And it's like sneakers just stay where you leave them. But boots, they must be reproducing and just like wandering around the house on their own in the middle of the night. And then they, they tip over and they're huge. Yes. Yes. I've I've got people who now have like huge man feet because I've got three boys. And so yeah, then the, the giant boots tip over and then it's like the entire floor just yeah, is populated with all yeah. the boots. Yeah. They're just everywhere. And I think that is it that they're top heavy, so they just fall over everywhere and they don't fit in the shoe racks and No, they don't. And if God forbid you do like I do and you get pissed off and you throw them, they just rain cow <laughs> shit the entire trajectory jacob this is what you're missing by not having livestock is cow shit just flinging off when you throw things yeah you just have muddy boots we get the uh, muddy and stinky anyway jacob what would you like to cuss and discuss this week? <laughs> well for me it's fun funding um where that's my thing i'm dreading oh my gosh i'm dreading uh i'm excited and dreading crop planning um, it's, it's, it's an kind of a nightmare for us. Running our farm is really difficult with trainees. Uh, everything takes 20 times longer than if you just do it yourself. Um, so it's really tough to kind of surrender your beautiful images of how your crops are going to go to, it's going to be a disaster because you're, you're training people and that's just how it goes. Um, so crop planning, I'm excited and also dreading the fundraising. Oh my God, I'm just so fucking tired of being um not valued for what we're doing and being marginalized and i just really um keep hoping for a funder to be like yeah here you go here's a multi-year contract here's some stability you guys are amazing you're so valuable to this you know country or the world or this region um now let's let, not, not just go 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 um man i wish for that yeah and without a bunch of strings tied to it too right without a bunch of strings without substandard funding um and then yeah the other thing that is business planning because it's been such a hard go um i know i have to go back to the drawing board and redesign a whole bunch of stuff for this coming year otherwise this coming year is going to be harder than it's already going to be if I don't plan ahead. Like we're saying, you know, hope for the best, plan for the worst. I do that every single year. Every year we end up pretty darn close or right at worst. So I'm not excited about doing that. I finished my rant. <laughs> Arlene, what do you have to cuss and discuss today? So I've been trying to figure out the wording on this one, and I think you're both going to know where I'm coming from on it. Um, so my cussing and discussing is... You talked before, Jacob, about the fact that we are minorities in the country in terms of agriculture. But I also know that agriculture, especially in North America, is such a small segment of the population. I mean, we're talking like I think it's two percent in Canada, less than that in the U.S. So it's a really small percentage wise group of people who are growing and raising food. And yet I feel like there's this friction sometimes between white farmers and First Nations farmers or First Nations people generally, because it feels like sometimes ours as colonialists, colonialists are like, well, we're proud of the land and my ancestors were here. You've got that pride in the land and pride in what your ancestors did for you. And so that, that sometimes gives the impression and some people I think feel that then they're like, well, this is my land. And so I need to protect it. And it's, it's mine kind of thing, which yes and no it is, but I feel like we're on the same team and so much of it becomes that 
that people that white farmers can't accept the fact that there were people who were farming this land or using this land, whether it was for agriculture or not, that this land was used by other people before we got here. And that that doesn't mean we can't simultaneously have pride for the, for what we're doing on the land, but also give credit to the people who were here before we were. So I hope that came out right. But I, I hate that there's this animosity when we we both have an end goal of feeding people and and preserving lands too. I mean, we farmers and First Nations people more than anyone know that this land is what sustains us and is what, you know, yes, makes money for us, but also is what makes it possible for everyone to be able to eat and live. And, you know, like the climate change is a lot of it has to do with how the land is used. So that we're we're working towards similar goals and there doesn't need to be this i guess yeah <laughs> it doesn't need to be there doesn't need mm -hmm. to be the friction that i feel like is often there yeah it's really deep <laughs> unfortunately in our country it's uh i mean i i'd like to say it took hundreds of years to create this friction and conflict and this genocidal experience is going to take some time to recover from it but I would like to see it moving a lot quicker than it is. I'll say that much. It's, it's moving pretty darn slow. And I wish that our agricultural organizations were taking the lead on it rather than sometimes feeling like they are being pulled into it or only doing it as window dressing. I think, too, it speaks, Arlene, to how much easier it is to destroy things than to build them. Because, you know, a 60-year-old woman with a backhoe could take a building down, but it's probably going to take more than one person to, to put something back. And it's, it's a lot easier to break things. So thank you so much, Jacob, for joining us today. If people want to learn more about Tea Creek, make a donation. Um, uh, just, yeah, know more about what you're doing. Where can they find you online? Where can they look you up? So please look us up at teacreek.ca, T-E-A-C-R-E-E-K dot C-A. -E -E uh, that's the best place to find us. Um, we can't do tax receipts for donations yet. We're still working on getting a charity up and running to do that. But uh, we appreciate any and all support. Thank you for joining us on Barnyard Language. If you enjoy the show, we encourage you to support us by becoming a patron. Go to www.patreon.com backslash Barnyard Language to make a small monthly donation to help cover the costs of making this show. Please rate and review the podcast and follow the show so you never miss an episode. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok as Barnyard Language, and on Twitter, we are Barnyard Pod. If you want to connect with other farming families, you can join our private Barnyard Language Facebook group. We are always in search of guests for the podcast. If you or someone you know would like to chat with us, please get in touch.